OK, so let me introduce uh, our panel. First of all, closest to me, Petri Talas. Petri is the uh, Secretary General of the WMO and formerly head of the Finnish Meteorological Office and was also lead author of the Arctic Climate Impact Ass Assessment. And I should just say, when you look at the perfect, almost perfect balance of our panel, that Petri is a member of the International Gender Champions Network. Uh, Petri, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Kelly Faulkner is uh, the director of the Office of Polar Programs uh, of the U.S. National Science Foundation, um, known as Moneybags to her very good friends, of which I'm sure there are an increasing number. Uh, $450 million budget for research uh, in the Arctic and Antarctic. Kelly, thank you very much for being with us. Andrea Tilke is the head of the Climate Action and Earth Observation Unit as the European Commission, where he has been for uh, much of the last decade, and uh, represents the EU on the IPCC, and is also the EU's representative uh, for the Second Arctic Science Ministerial in Berlin just about a year from now, and we may hear a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Mariana Kroglund is chair of the Arctic Council's Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. She is also Senior Advisor uh, at the Norwegian Environment Agency and uh, a biologist by profession. Marianne, thanks for joining us. And delighted to welcome Alan Pope as well. Alan is the Executive Secretary for the International Arctic Science Committee, actually based here at Akareri, and uh, very kindly has stepped in uh, at the last minute as uh, Larry Hintzman unfortunately was caught up uh, on a flight delay. So thank you for making that, uh, that noble step forward. Petri, let me start with you. We've just heard, heard from uh, John Holdren. We've heard a lot about the science behind the concerns that we have now. It is also true that you have to do an awful lot of convincing and persuading of the broader public out there that this science is right. How certain are you of the accuracy of the science you have at your disposal now? Uh, that's a good question. First, I would like to thank uh, President Crimson and uh, the Icelandic Meteorological Office for organizing us nice weather. So <laughs> everything is uh, sunny and nice uh, outdoors, but uh, our measurements are showing something very different. We have already melted 75% uh, of the mass of uh, Arctic uh, sea ice, which is a fairly dramatic uh, number. And we have also uh, been exceeding this 1.1 degree warming at the mid-latitudes, and if we include uh, the high latitudes, uh, the number, global warming number is uh, 1.3 degrees already, which is fairly close to this uh, Paris Agreement uh, 1.5 degree limit. We have uh, reached uh, record high concentrations of methane and carbon dioxide uh, recently, and we have broken 410 ppm level of uh, carbon dioxide, which is the uh, highest number in the past 800,000 uh, years. And uh, 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 Prince Albert has been funding ocean acidification measurement uh, program, and we know that uh, the sea, uh, sea, sea, o ocean water is uh, the most acid in 25 million years now, already now, and, and, and this uh, may, may, may continue. And then we have seen sea level rise since 1870, which is of the order of 26 centimeters uh, so far. And uh, when we talk about economy of, uh, of uh, disasters, uh, we know that uh, there has been a tripling of the, of the costs of uh, natural disasters uh, during the past uh, 30 years. And uh, more recently, we, we, uh, we have seen a record-breaking hurricane season hitting Caribbean and, uh, and, and southern parts of the uh, United uh, States. Uh, uh, we have never seen uh, so many Category 4 or 5 hurricanes in two weeks uh, uh, during our, our, our record and uh, the economic losses uh, related to those disasters uh, uh, are also going to be highest uh, ever in one hurricane season. And how much does that, for example, relate to what's going on here? So what is, uh, what is interesting, uh, that, that what also uh, we, we just heard from, from the previous presentation, is that the uh, so-called Chatham rule doesn't apply in the Arctic. So, so what happens in the Arctic uh, doesn't stay in the Arctic. Uh, it has an impact on the, on the weather patterns uh, globally and some of these unusual winter weather patterns that we have seen hitting uh, China, uh, Europe and, and North America, they are because of, uh, of melting of uh, snow and ice in the Arctic. Marianne, I'm going to be a little bit devil's advocate here, but uh, do, we, do you buy into all this? I mean, is there a danger that we exaggerate 
what we know, in fact, I mean, with, without wanting to extend the metaphor, but Donald Rumsfeld's famous, you know, there are things we know we know, there are things we know we don't know, there are things we don't know we don't know. There's an awful lot out there, and there's a, a, perhaps a, a large sparsity in, in many ways of data and information. How, how absolutely certain are we? Uh, I think we are pretty certain of, um, well, there are uncertainties, but uh, even if there are uncertainties, uh, I don't think we are uncertain about the directional change. It's difficult to, to project all the time the, the magnitude and, and the, the rate of change, but, uh, but still we know the direction of the change, and we know that uh, other places in the world will be heavily affected by the change going on in, in the Arctic. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, because once the Arctic change warming uh, gets going, that will have, that will influence a lot of people in the rest of the world. E even though a lot of these impacts are, are still to come to their, their, perhaps their peak, aren't they? Whether we talk about thawing of permafrost or, or other such areas. So, so is this about projecting forwards or is this about a, a, a certain knowledge? Uh, this is about projecting forward and we know that even if with the full implementation of the Paris Agreement, uh, the changes will continue towards the mid-century. And uh, what happens after mid-century will, of course, depend on how ambitious we are and, uh, and how early we take mitigation actions. Um, but we also know that even if, even if we have full Im implementation of the Paris Agreement, the Arctic will not look the same as it does today. Um, uh, by mid-century. And, and can I ask you, um, and you Kelly, actually, about perhaps the, the unknown unknowns, what, what are the biggest gaps now in our knowledge? Well, I'd like to remind people that one way that we understand what's going on today is to put it into context with what we've learned from past climate on Earth. And if we take a look at the records that we have of that, we are moving into an unprecedented space in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide and the rate at which we've introduced it to the atmosphere. So one major unknown is that we don't have a perfect analog for where we're headed. So we, we do very much need to reduce as best we can the uncertainties as we move out on projections in order to both adapt and mitigate to uh, change that we're committed to. I mean, I ask that partially because as a, as a lay person in this field, I was struck even just the other day, the, the, the meteorological office in Britain, we're celebrating, I don't think celebrating is the right word, we're commemorating 40 years since the hurricane of 1987 in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, and the point was made that the Met, the Met Office then had 1,200 observation points to work off and did not predict that hurricane. They now have 215 billion uh, points to work off, and they say, no, we still would not have predicted uh, what was coming. And that, Alan, that worries me, that data alone is not giving us all the answers, and do you really know as much as you tell us you know? Well, I think it's important to, to realize that, yes, as scientists, we're interested in building bigger data sets, studying areas we haven't studied before, but a lot of Arctic science is really to understand the processes underlying these observations. So if we can understand those processes better, then we can predict what's going to happen in other areas that we might not have as strong observation networks. Um, and we only need to look at things like ice sheets, where when we weren't studying them as intensely, we thought they, they don't do much, they don't flow very fast. When you start looking at them, they do flow very fast, they are dynamic. And because we saw those observations, we understand the processes of ice physics better, and then we can build better sea level rise observations, for example. Andrea, this perhaps moves us on to issues of, of coordinating what we do know and how best to do it. Of course, at the European Commission, the EU does fund and, and puts a lot of effort and time into, uh, into international work. But how, how hamstrung, how limited do you feel you are in that field? Well, I uh, don't want to talk of the limitations, but of, on the other side, on the positive side, I see that there is an exciting space for international science cooperation which is uh, progressively going on in the Arctic. And uh, um, we have, for instance, uh, started uh, a trilateral alliance with the US and Canada some years ago, a transatlantic research alliance. But this alliance uh, has uh, went well beyond and uh, has now launched a number of uh, major projects that uh, uh, have uh, cooperation from all uh, other countries, from Russia, from uh, uh, 
all countries also beyond uh, the uh, even China and uh, Korea and so on. So uh, there is a, a when you launch a good idea, then we see that people follow and uh, and associate. We have just uh, released a new major project uh, on the permafrost. His name is Nunatariuk. That uh, they told me in Inuit language means uh, from land to sea because it's about coastal. Uh, in particular, coastal uh, uh, permafrost. And uh, we thank uh, the NSF, which has given a, a, a major grant in order to add uh, scientific uh, cooperation from the US to this project. And, to, and, uh, and we know that uh, there is a discussion in Russia for supporting as well the Russian side. So we, we see a great dynamics in this. Do you see, Kelly, obstacles nonetheless to the, the level of coordination that, that is being achieved at the moment and, and should be achieved further down the line? Uh, so I would agree with Andrea that we have a tremendous amount of um, cooperation underway, but can there be more? Absolutely. I think uh, things that came out of the process that we used to develop the scientific cooperation agreement that was uh, signed in the spring among the Arctic Eight uh, revealed a number of things. For that particular agreement, we were focused on trying to facilitate the tremendous amount of planning and cooperation behind the, the, the science community, and we were working on what the sovereign nations could do to facilitate that. But we identified, as uh, John Holdren nicely pointed out, that we need to work within our own nations because we have many factors at play. So, for example, in the U.S., we have the uh, local and indigenous people, uh, local governance and so forth to, to bring together when we decide to cooperate internationally. Uh, another major area we talked about but we haven't got a final solution on is what you referred to as the money bags. Uh, are we getting together the funders in a, in a uh, reasonable uh, forum and, and frequently um, enough to, to be sufficient. And then as we move toward greater partnerships, as we're seeing in this forum, in terms of bringing in uh, industry and, uh, and other NGOs and so forth, are we going to be moving into a new space of partnership for funding research? How are we going to combine the resources available to us writ large. I mean, you put those out as questions. I wonder mm -hmm. if that they are actually, st are they statements really? We are going to have to find these new models of, of financial. Exactly. Project. I think those are the challenges that are immediately before us to take those next steps. Uh, and when we look at, at um, private funding and support, that usually comes with something attached to it. How much does that uh, perhaps put a hand behind your back when you're looking at the way in which you would want to develop your, your scientific research? Well, uh, you, you raise good points, but so government funding also comes with, um, you know, uh, priorities and so forth. Um, however, there are great examples of ways we've, we've managed to do this. I'm, uh, for example, very uh, pleased that we were able during the U.S. chairmanship to put out very innovative uh, product, which was a base map for all of the Arctic at a resolution never before um, uh, done less than a meter resolved for the digital elevation of the entire Arctic. That has tremendous benefits. That was a partnership with government agencies, uh, international fora, the private sector. Uh, so, so that gives us a, a way forward as, as we, we can define things that we all have common interest in. We, we can probably push out productively. I suppose part of my concern, yeah, Marianne, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I, I, I'm also concerned, but I, I think we need to sort of mainstream the uncertainty into the work we are doing. It's, uh, it's important to reduce uncertainty and understand uncertainty, but we also need to in, uh, mainstream it into uh, other work that we are doing. So I elaborate to explain that. Uh, well, um, it is, as you said, it is quite uh, often difficult to predict uh, what will happen. So, but uncertainty is something that we know will be there in the future. And uh, we need to be uh, flexible enough and, and resilient enough to be able to cope with uh, the uncertainty. So, um, yeah, we are quite used to basing our decision making on hard facts. Um, and uh, hopefully we will be able to do that also in the future, but we also need to take the uncertainty into account and into the work we are doing. 
And how, and how broadly can this, Petri, this sort of work go? I mean, we've, we've heard in the course of this morning, we've had this incredible array of speakers from all over the world here, from uh, Asia, from the Middle East, from, uh, from the Pacific Islands uh, are here. This is a global event, uh, become a global event like that. Does it need global coordination necessarily? <clears throat> we need uh, global uh, coordination and we need global resources and, and uh, we have to coordinate our efforts and uh, this time of the year when I was having uh, young children they started writing wish lists for the Santa Claus and Santa Claus is uh, living in Finland if you don't know uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> on my list uh, the Santa Claus uh, I have two, two I items uh, one is related to the Arctic uh, science and, and we don't uh, have a proper greenhouse gas monitoring network uh, globally and, and we need to enhance it also here in the, in, in the Arctic. Uh, for example, the release of methane from the Arctic melting permafrost and, and the, from the oceans, uh, that's one of the uh, unknowns and, and one threats uh, when it comes to climate change and, and, and the, we, we need to enhance uh, those measurements. And for example, here in Iceland, uh, there are no greenhouse gas me measurement sites and, and, and that will be needed and, and we have to enhance that uh, and, and we will discuss it uh, further in po Bonn at the co COP meeting and, um, and, and that will be an agenda item there. And the second thing that is missing is, is uh, uh, proper observations. Uh, we are not uh, able to provide uh, very good safety services for the Arctic and uh, that's a risk for the, for example, oil, oil tankers. There's a risk for grounded oil, oil tanker with uh, quite uh, disastrous consequences, and uh, and there's also risk that the passenger ship uh, would be grounded, and and, uh, and and there would be no means to rescue the people. A Titanic type of uh, accident. To, uh, to avoid it, uh, we have to enhance the observing systems, uh, telecommunication systems, and services. And there's a need for a dedicated polar satellite program for, for observing uh, weather, oceans and, and uh, sea ice and also tele for the telecommunication to deliver these uh, services for the Arctic uh, vessels and, and various uh, operators. So, right, so, so those are the issues for, for my Santa Claus uh, list. Right, well you keep, yeah, you've referred to Santa Claus and referred to absolute needs, but who is Santa Claus? It's, uh, it's, it's very much the countries and, and uh, we as a WMO, we are coordinating these kind of things and uh, we are pinpointing uh, the needs and, and, and these two things are the obvious uh, needs when we talk about Arctic. Andrea. Well, um, Arctic observations, uh, you put, uh, Peter, a very important point. Uh, it's a fundamental step from which we start from doing uh, anything uh, on research uh, and then in, on, in, on uh, operational activities later on. But uh, this was uh, one of the main arguments uh, discussed at the first uh, Arctic Science Ministerial in Washington DC one year ago. And uh, this was, I guess, to, I have to pay tribute to John Holden, who was the organizer of this first uh, ministerial. And uh, it will be a major uh, uh, aspect of the discussion in the second Arctic Science Ministerial that we are now, together with uh, Germany and Finland, co-organizing in, Ber in Berlin the 25th and 26th uh, October 2018. Uh, but uh, we want to do something new because uh, in particular uh, for Arctic observations, being that you need a long-lasting activity and you need investments from government. So we want to put uh, on the table of uh, the ministers some other data. How much is the cost? of observing essential variables for the Arctic. How much is the benefit of these observations? We are trying to develop this also in cooperation with SOUN and uh, with the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, uh, a, a sort of impact assessment that uh, we hope to be able to present on, to the ministers in order that everyone can take decisions. So if we invest such, we have back so much value more and this may be a base for s sound decisions then. Marianne, you were nodding there in, in agreement. Um, how, how, obviously, it's a big political move to have taken and to now to sustain, to have the, the uh, Arctic Science Ministerial. Is there more it could do? Is it the way it works? Does, do you think that's the, the correct way, the access to ministers? Is there more you could do with that? Yeah, I think access to ministers is, of course, very important. We uh, uh, have 
I'm working within the Arctic Council, and we have the Arctic Council ministerials, and that's really important to sort of anchor the work we are doing at a scientific level with the, the level that can actually provide actions. Um, but also, um, the science ministers and the environmental ministers, not the least, are, are very important. Um, the Arctic Council and its working groups, uh, in addition to other organizations, international institutions, have done a lot of, uh, of uh, assessments and pinpointed knowledge gaps uh, and made recommendations that could form a good basis for discussions at the science ministerial, I would think. And uh, within the Arctic Council, we also uh, work a lot together with uh, those who are uh, holders of traditional and indigenous knowledge. Uh, and that's also important to integrate, I think, uh, to uh, a science ministerial. Uh, definitely. Uh, indigenous peoples will be part uh, of uh, uh, the constituency. Uh, we hope to be able to even enlarge the number of uh, governments that were present uh, already in, uh, in Washington DC, that were 24 plus the European Union. Uh, but uh, what is, uh, uh, I guess, uh, important is to show that uh, the Arctic is a problem of the planet. Uh, and for this, uh, you need this broader uh, constituency because uh, uh, the problems that happen in the Arctic are because of things that happen outside the, of the Arctic. But what is happening in the Arctic is having a major impact on the rest of the planet, and therefore everyone has to take the responsibilities for that. And, and Kelly, in terms of the ministerial, you were there at the, at the, uh, the ministerial last year. Um, how much of a step forward is it in terms of this effort at coordination? Everyone has talked already today, and we'll carry on, of course, about the need to work together, uh, to pull together, to coordinate. Does it, how much of a step forward is that? Well, it, it was something that the U.S. put out there as an experiment, and it's clear from the Europeans picking up and wanting to take it forward that I think it was viewed as a universal success. And I echo Marianne's comments on, on um, that as an important element of engaging all the way up through the political structure in order to be sure that all of the grassroots efforts and everything are well connected, that you have things that are being organized at every level uh, of society in order to, to make progress on these important issues. Uh, one of the questions, sorry, Marianne, were you no. coming back in on that? Yeah, um, I'm also thinking one of the uh, experiences we have within the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program is the need to engage more tightly with industries and uh, businesses. And uh, uh, it is important that we have platforms that allow us to allow the scientists to talk with the end users of, of the science and of the data that we actually have. Because that presumably, Pr Prince Albert mentioned it, uh, you've mentioned it, that is where the innovation street mm. comes from, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's a great example. That's something that International Arctic Science Committee is trying to work towards both at this meeting and at the Arctic Observing Summit that we're planning next June, which is going to be entirely based around discussions of what societal benefit areas of Arctic observations are and where the, the business case, if you will, of that is. And that's within the science community to make sure that not only the Arctic 8, but also you know, the global community, I ask as 23 different member countries are all talking about that. Um, and as in, in able to, to talk about that societal benefit with not just the science community, but also the industry, business community, and local communities. We, we have a specific point of R4, which was about an investment plan, um, a way ahead to raise the money necessary, the funding necessary uh, for the projects that you all deem to be necessary. Um, is that coming together, Kelly? Do you, do you have a genuine confidence? I mean, I think, again, people would sooner accentuate the positive, and I get that. Um, but if that is a, a, a sort of a, a goal, I'll be reaching that goal. I would say it's a work in progress. <laughs> Um, and I think the kinds of uh, meetings that we're discussing here are extremely important. I have to say, you know, I, I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish, but to me it's extremely heartwarming to see this audience, to understand that it's 50 countries and 2,000 people that care about this issue. Um, I don't think we have universal across the globe understanding of the impact of this issue, but it is an encouraging step to see this happening because it's within my career time, and I'm older, I agree, but um, it's not that long. <laughs> We've come to reckon on just what was said uh, so nicely by Andrea, that 
that the Arctic is not isolated on our planet and that what happens there really does have impacts for all of us. But what we have been doing in, has impacted the Arctic. So our collective responsibilities are high. And um, you mentioned also, you, uh, you, you spoke earlier about the, the, the importance of the curiosity within science, of the desire to go and find out new things, explore new things, not necessarily knowing where you're going even. That's a difficult sell, isn't it? Uh, right, although I'd like to say, you know, that's the National Science Foundation in the U.S. prides itself on relying on um, peer review, merit review, and having a very open uh, system for allowing ideas, best ideas, to emerge from anywhere. Uh, I would like to be sure that we constantly remind us ourselves of that in, in, in the funding world and in the science planning world, because things... As I mentioned before, we are headed to uncharted territory for the Arctic and our planet, and it's a quite complex climate system. Uh, and, and there are things like, I could give you an example of, um, there was recently uh, an event of a tsunami in Greenland that took the lives of uh, villagers quite unexpectedly. It wasn't earthquake induced. Okay, so that was something nobody had predicted particularly. We do need to understand the generation of that and, and what the future is for that. But these emergent conditions that come from our complicated world are things we need to leave room and space for uh, exploring. Um, now, uh, Andrea. <laughs> yeah, and I guess that we have to go again further together in sharing data and uh, of uh, existing uh, data and these observations. Uh, at least from our side, we are trying to do our part and we open completely the Copernicus program to everyone. Um, everybody can download uh, data and uh, through this fleet of uh, Sentinel uh, new, new uh, satellites, there are numbers of uh, uh, very interesting uh, variables for polar regions that can be uh, seen. Uh, I guess that this has to become a, a program for everyone and to be shared. We are trying to do this through the GEO initiative that uh, includes uh, uh, more than 100 countries and uh, private and other organizations uh, uh, together. And um, I'm confident that uh, we will get uh, somewhere. Alan? So you, you ask about funding, and I, I know it feels like to scientists that we're constantly asking for money, right? But I think it's also important to point out that the science community is working together to try and jointly craft research priorities, right? The science community works through the International Arctic Science Committee, other groups, EU PolarNet held a workshop last week or two weeks ago to identify joint polar research priorities. So the science community is bonding together to try and speak with one, one voice to say these are the priority areas um, and getting to work with, for example, the uh, sustaining Arctic observing networks, doing the same thing to say to enhance data sharing, these are the things we need to do, getting networks of observation networks to work together, right, um, to do the most with the resources that we have. Petri. <clears throat> one of the nice thing, achievements of uh, WMO is that we have, uh, we have always had the free exchange of data and, and that's the basis of uh, all weather forecasts and, and, and climate services, and, and, and we are very much promoting that. And, uh, and, and every observation that are made uh, ground, from ground-based satellite observations, balloons, uh, aircraft, or vessels, uh, it's made available for everybody in coming minutes. And, and, uh, and that's what the WMO is, uh, is, 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 is about. Finally, perhaps I would like to say that uh, m many of you are looking for economic benefits uh, that are cooking uh, while, while these uh, Arctic shipping routes are opening and so forth. But globally, we are talking about the problem that will be a major issue for the, for the mankind. And, and, and uh, this climate mitigation is a serious issue. And, and uh, there are positive signs at the moment. Uh, we, are move, we have started uh, slowly moving in the right direction, but we are not uh, moving fast enough. Uh, we, we, we expect to see three to four degree warming uh, by the end of this century if we are not uh, going to do anything. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and I would like to urge you to raise the ambition level. Of course, you can benefit from this Arctic uh, changes, but uh, gl globally, the big picture will be totally different. But sorry, are you actually putting out a message to say, stop thinking about how you can benefit from global warming in this area? Yes, people can see where the changes are, maybe they can. You can't think about that. You 
I think that we have, we have to also benefit from this change, so that's, uh, that's, that's clear, but, uh, but the big picture is, is quite uh, grey or even black, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a common challenge for all of us. Marianne? Uh, I only wanted to make a small point, and uh, even if it's costly with uh, improving the science and monitoring and observing networks, it's also costly if we don't do it. I think it's, uh, it's important to remember that uh, uh, if we are not investing in a safer future, that will be an economic time bomb as well. Thank you. Kelly? Uh, so I agree, uh, absolutely, and I feel like we could bring it back to the Prince's point, uh, where he sponsored the prize for innovation, that we have great hope that uh, with innovation and new technology, we're going to become more effective and efficient, and more cost-effective in, in observations in the near future. There are all kinds of things. I would say with Andrea's point with respect to data sharing, we do have fundamental issues with the different types of data. It's a little easier for a, a forecast-focused data uh, system to be truly international, but as we cut across all the way to social sciences and, and human health in the Arctic, we are challenged. However, again, innovation may be our savior there. There are ways to move across languages that are coming on that are, are going to help facilitate our, our sharing. So. Okay, well, it just, I, I would just say we're going to have to close it there. I've seen the, the clocks on us. Um, but I don't think you're a Pollyanna. I think you're an optimist, which is a good thing. I should say I'm not a devil's advocate, really. I'm a journalist, so um, I'm likely to take that side of the coin as well. Um, but thank you very much indeed for uh, some stimulating uh, discussion and issues to consider and take away our panel, ladies and gentlemen.